Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the next iteration of the Agents for Creative Action podcast interview series. Um, today, we'll be talking with Michael Colster, who we are so excited to finally sit down and chat with today. Um, we were actually scheduled to meet you in person um, a day after we got an email announcing the closure of our school amidst the nationwide shutdown. Um, and in that, this socially distanced time, we're trying to catch up with staff members of the museum um, and also artists. And we're so excited to finally sit down with you. Um, Michael Holster has two um, photographs up in the uh, Landmarks exhibit right now. Um, and that's what we're going to be chatting with him today about. Uh, he's also a graduate of Williams. Um, majored in American studies um, and has is currently teaching at Bowdoin um, and yeah so if we want to first introduce ourselves I'm Erica um, I'm an art history and practice major uh, I'm a senior cool um, I'm CJ I am also a senior and I'm an art history major and my name is Javier, um, I'm a sophomore, um, and I'm an art history and studio major. Um, so I'm, I'll start, and to dive in, I was wondering if you could just introduce yourself and tell us just a general description of your practice, and if you could mention specifically your works in, that are currently being exhibited in landmarks at the museum. Sure. Um, let's see if I can um, if I can do this. Um, the the best way to talk about the work that's up in the museum is to talk a little bit about the larger project that the pictures came from. If that's okay. Um, yeah. And basically, yeah. Okay. Um, it it it, uh, it comes from a project that I've worked on since. I mean, I really started working on it in two thousand and eight. Um, so. I started a long time ago and mm, I don't think I'm really still working on it, but some issues that came up as a result of the project do carry through work that I'm doing now. Um, but the work that's up in the museum comes from uh, a series of photographs that I made of some rivers in, in the United States. And I started photographing the river that's right out the window of my studio here um, that goes right through um, uh, Brunswick where I live and teach. It's called the Androscoggin River and that river is a river that's um, pretty important in the history of, of the United States because it was one of the 10 most polluted rivers in the, um, in the country as of about 1970. And so um, it was famous or infamous for being really smelly, really polluted, and really horrible. People had a really hard time going near it. Um, and, I, and, um, and so I was really fascinated by hearing, um, th hearing these stories of people telling me about this river um, that, uh, that I was living near, but it didn't seem that way at all now. It was really fairly clean, or it appeared to be pretty clean, and it wasn't that smelly. Um, in fact, it was pretty nice to spend time near it, and I realized that um, a lot of the area that I lived in here was profoundly shaped by that river because of the mills and all the industry, or at least the um, remnants of the industry that were uh, left along its banks. And it reminded me a little bit of the Housatonic, right? Um, we're running right near and through Williamstown. Um, and, you know, and then also went, made its way down through Connecticut, where I lived for a little while. And I realized that the history of the river um, is intimately tied to the history of the human occupation around it. And then all these different rivers along the East Coast, especially, had really similar trajectories, really, really um, developed industrially, became really polluted, and then in the last 20 or 30 years, well, 40 years, it started to become a lot cleaner. And so that when you go to the rivers, it's hard to tell um, by just looking at it um, how profoundly uh, changed a river system, the river system really is. So one of the challenges that I had when I started making pictures of the Androscoggin, and then I went on to make pictures of the James in Virginia, and one of the pictures in the museum is from the James River, and the Schuylkill, that runs through Philadelphia. And one of the pictures in the museum uh, show is from the Schuylkill. And then I also went down and photographed the Savannah River. Is all these rivers along the East Coast, many, many of them have really similar histories and trajectories. 
And so this is a long way of sort of getting at your, your answer, which is that I started making pictures of the river here um, and then went on later on to photograph these other rivers. But I, I made them with a variety of methods to try to see if there was a way that I could get people to sort of see beyond just the, the traditional or conventional beauty of the river and, and to sort of think a little bit about its history. And I got really lucky by complete coincidence I stumbled onto um, this process of making pictures that comes from the very beginning of the invention of photography called wet plate collodion. And I really was a coincidence that I started thinking about making photographs on glass using the wet plate collodion process. And then I was also photographing the river and stumbling around for some way to make pictures of it that I thought were meaningful and interesting. And then I was like, oh, well, why don't I try taking pictures with wet plate collodion of the river? And then uh, fireworks went off. Uh, it was like one of the wonder most wonderful um, uh, discoveries that I've made photographically, where the process itself started to do so much of what I needed it to do in um, helping people think about the history of, or at least the impl impl implications of the places that I was actually photographing. And the reason for that is twofold. First, um, the wet plate process involves pouring um, chemistry, liquid stuff onto pieces of glass right by the river or by wherever your subject is, and then hand making the plate to make it sensitive to um, light, and then making the photograph while it's still wet, and then developing it right then and there. And it's really exciting, it's really unpredictable, and you can never tell how the picture's gonna come out. But I also realized as I was making it, it's like, this was just like, what? Um, I was using a wet process to photograph a wet subject. And that kind of um, co co coordination, or I should say that kind of sort of uh, synergy was really exciting. And the thing was, is that the photographs themselves show some of the traces of that instable or, or unstable kind of movement of chemistry in the formation of the image. And if you want to take it further, it's like, so how, so, how interesting that actually the, the chemistry that moves across the plate um, is uh, in some ways analogous to the flow of the river and, the, um, and the, the silver that's left on the plate is analogous to the sediments that kind of form on the bottom of it. So there's this wonderful kind of one-to-one -one relationship between what I was kind of um, coming up with and what I was actually trying to describe in the pictures themselves. The second part of the, the revelation that um, I, I got really excited about when I make, made pictures this way was the fact that this is a process that was invented in 1851, right around the time that the rivers started to become heavily industrialized. And so that this wonderful kind of coincidence of photographic um, uh, practice, medium, the invention of it, was basically um, coincidentally, historically co coincident with the industrialization of these rivers. And so I thought about, wow, well, the forces that gave rise to the industrialization and the adulteration of these rivers were some of the same forces that gave rise to the invention of photography. They're kind of this sort of similarly linked. And then I start, started realizing that, wow, photography is in some ways an agent or it carries um, some of this industrial legacy as much as the mills along the sides of the rivers do. Um, and so that started to become really exciting to me too. Um, but um, does, does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I mean, there's so much more that I could say, but I don't wanna go on forever on, on this sort of stuff. But I hope that that kind of gives you a little bit of a sense of how the works in the museum which are ambrotypes, which are um, uh, one of a kind, um, uh, really faintly um, exposed and developed images that revert to positive in front of a black background um, sort of came to be. I Next. think, um, yeah, I think on that line of like sort of the collapsing of past and like the here and now of the development, um, actually in like the physical space. I was wondering if um, your photographs sort of represent that present, past, um, but also maybe a future 
Um, if we're thinking about landscapes and thinking about um, change over time, I'm wondering if you regularly think about climate change or um, the increasing like changing of landscapes and if that's reflected in your practice at all? Yeah, I, 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 um, I think about change over time a lot. And I think that there's something really poignant, even paradoxical about um, how photography directly engages maybe more than any other medium um, with the idea of change over time. By fixing an image, by stilling something, I think it really brings into high relief the fact that nothing is still and everything is changing all the time. And I think the thing that's interesting about photographing landscape or place is that I think we bring to it assumptions that it's static or that it, it, it doesn't change that much. And it's so, um, I think that that's what we would hope in some ways, because maybe we are scared of or, or, or somewhat um, unsure about how to deal with change. But how fascinating to me it is that the places that we occupy are constantly changing in response to and influenced by our presence. So they become living portraits of us um, or certainly direct reflections. And so um, that's something I think about a lot. The other thing I think about a lot is uncertainty and the ways in which we confront it and deal with it and think about it. And um, when um, we photograph a place and I use this strange process to make pictures with it, um, there's so much uncertainty that is injected into the process that excites me. And I can only hope that a little bit of that uncertainty is sensed or perceived when looking at the work. And that's part of the reason why I get really excited when I'm given an opportunity, like at Williams, to have the plates shown instead of prints from the plates. Um, because those plates are so weird and they're so, I think, hard to completely uh, approach and fully understand how it is they're saying what they're saying. And I'm also hoping because of the fact that they do reference um, a certain look and set of tones that come from a long time ago, that people wonder when were these made and were they made a long time ago or were they made fairly recently? And I think that that question of when also, I hope, stimulates questions about the future as well. So if this is the way things might have looked then, but now, but they look now, um, how might they look in the future? So that those things are in, in, intimately um, intertwined. I mean, I also have this kind of half-baked theory. It came up, you know, when I was doing a lot of therapy. But I think in some ways it's kind of true. And that is that I don't know if really the future or the past even exist. But there's something really wonderful about looking very directly and, 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 and as hard as you can at what is the present and begin to understand how we track or give meaning to that present. And inevitably, I think we construct some of these ideas of past and present, past and future to be able to sort of not go crazy and to be able to sort of deal with things. And, you know, there's a lot of other convenient things that come from it too. But, um, but yes, you know, your question hits on some very central um, concerns um, that I have. Um, and, and there's, I, I, I don't know, if, I don't know, it's weird, but photographing place or landscape, um, is to me one of the most exciting things about it to me is that the fact that it's never the same anytime i go back to it and the river becomes an embodiment of that change over time great um it seems like you're really touching on a lot of like um, central points regarding time and space um and so i guess i want to build off of that um, I, I, and I'm really interested in like the Greek root of the uh, that's found in ambrotype. So ambrotos, which means imperishable or immortal. Um, and you've talked about the implications that the use or that the process has in terms of documenting the flux or the fluctuation of these rivers. Um, and so I'm thinking about it more in terms of the 
kind of the ethical stakes of the photograph being an environmental trace of that river as it once was or as it might be, you know, when the state of the river and the histories that it recalls are kind of suspended, you know, suspended upon the surface and suspended or at least um, kind of inscribed or accrued in the process of making. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to that notion of of the trace of the index that's both material and kind of like procedurally created. Hmm. Well, I mean, uh, I don't know if this is where where you're going with this, but I, I think there's something that's um, uh, possibly linked to what you're saying or what you're asking about, and 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 it has to do with the fact that I think it's very bizarre that I have to carry. 300 pounds of chemistry and equipment down to the river to make these pictures. And along with them, I'm bringing some fairly volatile and fairly um, um, not, not well, kind of toxic chemicals with me. Um, like for instance, I bring with me silver nitrate. And if you sort of get silver nitrate on your hands or any organic matter, it stains it. Um, and if it gets in your eyes, it makes you go blind. Okay, um, so it's it's it, and also using um, a, a chemical called ether that's mixed into the collodion, so that it used to be you know used as an anesthetic, um, and it's also highly flammable. So it's it's kind of dangerous. Um, I don't teach this process to my college students um, because I don't know how we would be able to contain some of the environmental. Um, complications and here I am going down with and I'm going I got rolls of paper towel okay because I need to wipe off plates and I need to clean things as I'm in the middle of it and I'm also ironically bringing with me gallons of water okay that I need to use to clear plates after I've um, after I've uh, processed them and so I think it's ironic that to go and photograph and begin to engage in a conversation around um, so at least some of the questions that come up about whether a landscape, um, now that it's become a little cleaner, um, but no longer pure, what kind, of a, um, what kind of a state does it occupy? And here I am bringing to it and bringing to this investigation all these different chemicals that um, could actually um, contaminate it further, right? Um, and, and so um, that, that to me, and, and also like all the mills, along the river, many of the mills along the river, some of them that still exist and still operate, um, put a lot of pollution into the river as a result of making paper. So a lot of paper mills, and I brought processed paper, rolls of, of, uh, of paper towels down with me as part of this process as well. So, I mean, I think there's some funny ironies in the midst of all of this. And I also think that, you know, there's an irony at least of photographers going out and making photographs of sort of pure nature to try to get people to think more clearly about the value of nature. Yet the whole um, process of making photographs is highly industrialized, <laughs> right? And highly technological. And so I think that there are wonderful ways in which these things kind of um, fly by each other and, and, um, and, and, and they're wonderful kinds of complications and contradictions that um, doesn't offer a very easy answer. But I'm not sure if I'm getting at what it is that you're asking me. So it, 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 does that help at all? Or, or do you want to try to reframe the question a little? No, it does. Um, and I think like you, in hearing you speak, you talk about something that I, at least like I didn't consider, which is the material kind of like volume of the process and what it entails in terms of the technology that you're using. And in terms of the actual like footprint or environmental footprint that it has rather than in terms of the kind of like formal footprint that it leaves or creates. Um, so I think that it went in like a um, like an unexpected but a really great direction. So I'll pass it okay. on to the okay. next question. Okay, good. Um, so thinking like about footprints um, and what gets what continues to live on um, in terms of your works after lives, both materially and conceptually, like what do you envision for them? Like where do you see them existing? Where do you see them going? Okay, yeah, I'll try. I'll try to answer that. Um, 
I think it's it's a nice question. Um, I'll take it uh, materially, okay? And and that and I don't know if this is what you mean, but I'll try, okay? Uh, or if this is where you're going um, with it. But um, one of the things that I think I I've been thinking a lot about, um, and and inevitably um, I think whenever you make photographs, this comes up, and that is um, of 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 the of I don't want to I don't want to put it too bluntly. Um, photographs reference things that are gone, right? They reference things that will no longer be. So on some level, they're about loss. On some level, they're also a little bit about, um, about wondering what's going to happen after, um, afterwards. And you're talking about afterlife, right? So I think it's, it's a cool question. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about, well, when I make pictures, I'd kind of like, the, I'd like them to outlive me. Okay. I want them to, to live after me. And I get really, and I realized too that at the same time when I started making pictures, there's something about the process of the material itself that I loved so much. And the fact that if I treated the materials correctly, they would outlive me, right? Um, the, the, the life of at least certain ways that photographs are made um, can be quite long if they're taken care of. So one of the things that's interesting about the amber type and the glass plate is that it's one of the most archival processes that's known to the world in the photographic, you know, sort of realm. Um, so it's, it's incredibly stable. Now, ir ironically, paradoxically or whatever, it's on a sheet of glass, which can break really easily, right? But if you take care of it, um, you can expose it um, to ultraviolet light. I don't think it's going to go anywhere. Um, everyone's worried about, you know, exposing uh, inkjet prints or pigment prints to light. And I, I have no confidence that um, the kinds of prints that we're making right now with ink um, sprayed onto paper um, will last very, very long. Or at least they certainly, I doubt they will last as long as something that's metal-based, like silver-based. So the afterlife materially excites me in the sense that if um, some of this work is in the right hands, then it's reasonable to think that it might last for a really long time, if that's where you're going with the question, right? Yeah. And, okay, and then the other part of it, which is even more exciting to me, is, is this conceptual afterlife, right? And that meaning, I take that to mean, in, in, in a selfish way, how is the work feeding my next projects going forward? And how is, um, how is, how is it inspiring me to, to sort of think? And how has it changed me? And one of the things that's most profound about making pictures for me in this way, making amber types, is that it um, was, um, I don't know how to say it, it was, it was a, a moment in, in my making of pictures where I knew nothing. I didn't know how to make these things. I had to learn everything from, from, this, from fresh. Um, I couldn't predict how the pictures were gonna come out and I completely loved that. So one of the things that's happened as a result of working on the project is that I constantly am looking for ways of making pictures where I cannot predict outcomes or at least I have a limited ability to predict outcomes. And then with that limited ability, I can sort of see the outcomes and I can be like, wow, that's not what I expected, but it's still within the realm of what I was hoping for. And I, I tell my students this all the time, that whenever I find something that um, I've uh, not expected, but that I'm drawn to and I'm interested in, that means I'm, I'm growing. That means I'm learning something, you know? And, and that's pro very profoundly what happened to me when I made pictures with the web play process. After 25 years of photographing in ways that I could start to kind of predict how things were going to work. Um, and so uh, a variety of different projects since then um, have kind of caused, um, ha have engaged with this idea of not being able to predict outcomes. Um, and the other thing too is that I've got um, some other projects that I'm working on that are, are um, very much engaged with the question of how is a place changing over time? And how do we begin to perceive that change over time? Um, one of them is photographing um, on a beach in Hawaii. Um, and there's all this plastic that's being, um, because of its you know, relationship to sea currents and this thing called the North Pacific Gyre, which is this big, huge garbage patch in the middle of the ocean, 
Um, this, this beach tends to get a lot of plastic um, uh, uh, blown up onto it. And these geologists discovered that um, some of the plastic, when it's inadvertently melted into the rock that's on the beach, they think it's going to become uh, a, uh, uh, a, these, 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 these hybrids of plastic and rock that's melted together, they call them plastic agglomerates. They think they're going to actually become part of the fossil record. And so they're going to become um, these uh, horizon markers for the Anthropocene millions of years from now. So actually going back to Erica's question about the future, um, these are, in a sense, portraits of us in the future. And so, um, I, and I don't think, I, I don't really think I would have ever gone to Hawaii to make these pictures unless I had spent time along these rivers thinking about similar kinds of things um, uh, at the, you know, uh, previously. And so, um, that's a couple of examples um, of that. The other thing that I, I do in the, in the plastic agglomerates to make it more uncertain is I've been photographing them in stereo. So they're stereographs. If you've ever seen those things where you can look into a stereo viewer and you get two photographs and they go into 3D in your mind. Um, one of the things that I do is I photograph them with two cameras and I print them so that when you look at them, you can use a stereo viewer to see them in 3D. And these are literally just like these weird looking plastic, molten pl uh, plastic stuff on the beach. And they get really cool when they go 3D. But what I like doing too is I put, I switch the left and the right eye. And if you cross your eyes, you can make them go in 3D without the viewer. And what I like about that is like, I can never tell how the picture is going to look in 3D when I'm making it. I only know how it's going to look when I get back home later on and I start compiling the images and seeing them as their 3D versions. So um, I don't know. Does that does that answer um, um, yeah, part of the question? Perfect. Please? No, that was perfect. Oh, good. Thank you. Oh, good. So I guess pivoting to another aspect of your practice, um, I'm really interested in the black and white in the black and white nature of your photographs and specifically the kind of histories and the patinas that it can evoke. Um, and so, especially in like a very color or like in a photographic color saturated and overstimulated world, right? Um, and so I'm really interested to hear from you as to what qualities we can pick up on as viewers when colors deprive from us, you know? And, Maybe this is in terms of process or in terms of the kind of like unexpected things that come from looking um, on a very on a limited kind of color register. Um, and what does it mean to maintain like such a practice or style um, as photography itself as a medium proliferates or has proliferated? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I um and I don't know if I have a really good answer for it. Um, uh, I, 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 I'll, I'll try it this way. One of the ways that I think is interesting is like, it's, a, it's like asking the question, well, why do you use charcoal instead of pastel um, to draw things, right? And, 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 and I think that um, there can be, you know, there can be really good answers to that question. Um, I don't know if my answer is that good, except for I like the idea that, um, uh, this will come back almost to the to the point that I was talking about with Erica, which is that um, photographs are strange in the way that they make you pay more attention to, uh, they can make you pay more attention to the world around you by doing things that the world isn't. Um, in other words, we think about how the world is, um, is uh, changing all the time when a photograph stops it. Um, and I think what's interesting is to um, make photographs in black and white and help us realize how colorful the world is. Um, and, and I also love the idea that the photograph, when it is monochromatic, um, can still be persuasive as a slice of realism. And, 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 and how wonderful um, you can take five or six tones and have someone move into the picture and imagine a world with that. Um, and so I guess it's just like um, one of the things that I love about making pictures is the ways in which um, it imposes constraints. And I've understood through the wet play process, especially because there's, there's so many things I can't photograph with it. 
there's so many places I can't go to make pictures with it simply because of the um, ridiculously cumbersome aspect of it. And I still can't believe that I made pictures with it, okay? Because of all that's involved in making pictures with it. Um, and so that, so um, I guess where I'm trying to go with that is, um, is that uh, the, 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 um, oh man, you know something, I lost it. Where was I going? Yeah, you can't help me. Um, well, I guess the, 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 the basic idea here being in the black and white is that um, if, 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 you can, if you can look at it and believe it and spend time with it, whether it's in color or not, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, and the other thing that I think is really important too is that I've always been drawn into situations where I can have as much of my hands in the process as possible to feel it and to, um, and to move it and to mold it and to shape it. And one of the problems is that color doesn't afford as much of that um, direct uh, experience. So it's, it's not as much fun. Um, but I will say like, for instance, the um, Hawaiian project is mostly in color. Um, it's mostly, you know, using colors um, to differentiate between natural and man-made forms or um, objects. So there's a little bit of that going on too. I, I think that, um, I think that, Possibly, I don't know. I, I've been thinking about this a lot because for the last six months I've been in the darkroom almost constantly making black and white prints using traditional film, silver gel and uh, paper. And I'm, I keep asking myself, why the hell am I doing this? It's so outdated. It's so outmoded. Who cares? Right? And I still completely fall in love with the way that the tonalities in the black and white print look. Um, and that's what I kind of meant earlier by not having probably a very good answer. It's just something that um, I kind of can't believe when I'm able to um, make it, basically. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> I think in a similar vein, I, with the Landmarks works specifically, um, you said you were, it was exciting to have the plates up um, for those instead of the prints. And I'm wondering how you think about um, the material of the plate and res like specifically the reflective quality um, of the plates. Because uh, I know when you're visiting the um, exhibit in person, which we no longer can do, unfortunately, um, the quality of the plates and sort of like the shimmering effect is really, really sort of brilliant and stands out against a lot of the other works. Um, so I just was wondering if you had any thoughts about that process and using that material and putting it um, in a gallery. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I remember first making the plates and up until now as I still make them, I see, I see them and I kind of can't believe them. I mean, I really mean that they just shock me every single time I make these things and they kind of bring out a kind of awe. Um, and, and, and it's mainly because of the fact that these things just defy logic. Um, they, when you hold them up to light and I can do that right here. When you hold the thing up to light, you can basically, you can't, you see through it. Like there's almost nothing there, but when you put, when you put something black in front of it, it becomes positive. So that doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense. It defies um, understanding or logic. Um, and so I don't get that. And, and so that if I can find a way that I can show that in a gallery, then I can share some of that sort of excitement and strangeness um, with the viewers. And so um, I worked for a long time um, to try to figure out how to mount the plates in such a way that you might be able to have something similar to that experience. 
And um, at first I used velvet um, and I worked really hard to find a way to actually have the plates mounted off of the black surface and be held there because traditionally ambrotypes aren't shown that way. Traditionally, ambrotypes are actually um, painted black on the glass side and they're shown with the varnish or the emulsion side facing out. So it would be a mirror image and you wouldn't really get a sense of the fact that you're actually looking at a piece of glass with hardly anything on it. <laughs> and, and so, and I also, you know, I didn't want a mirror image. I wanted it to show the, the place as you might see it if you were standing there. And I really wanted to feature the fact that this is kind of like sculpture. It's kind of like a, a, a piece of glass that has volume, it has depth. And um, I finally came up with the idea with the help of a, a friend, a curator, um, used to be at the Eastman House. And she said, use black plexi. She said, use black plexi instead of velvet, get it out of the 19th century, get it into the 21st. And, um, and she was so right, she was totally right. And what I like about it too is that when you see the plate um, suspended off its mounts, um, about a quarter of an inch from the surface of the black plexi, and you get a good strong spotlight on it, you can actually see a bit of the negative projected onto the pr uh, plexi behind it. So you can have kind of a simultaneous experience of the positive and the negative, I hope. Also, the thing, too, is that I think we have, we have sort of the conventional ideas about photography, and that is that it's, um, a photograph is, is kind of a window into a world. And um, they're usually they're presented with these mats, and you're, you're, the materiality of the object is often um, underplayed, if not dismissed. And so this is a situation where it's kind of like, listen, this is one of a kind. Um, it has material heft. Um, to try to find a way in which that can be displayed and, um, and then uh, hopefully uh, understood, appreciated, um, uh, was, was a really high priority for me. The other thing too, and you know, uh, this is again just sort of um, obvious, so sorry, but um, I, I love the way that water reflects light. Um, I love the way that, you know, uh, different patterns of, of light, you know, dance and move across the surface of water. And so that in some ways, glass and water share certain kinds of um, characteristics. Uh, great. Um, I was just wondering how you're doing on time. Do we still have time for a couple questions more or? Yeah, whatever, whatever you guys want. I can, I can be here for, for forever. I don't care. <laughs> sure. Um, so this is a bit of a shift in topic, um, more about yourself rather than your work. Um, so you've mentioned your students a couple of times. Um, so you're yeah. currently an associate professor of art at Bowdoin College, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the role of the role that teaching art might have in your life, or how it impacts your own artistic practice. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's also, that's a really good question. And it's very hard to, um, to sort of disentangle um, the two. Um, but I, I will say that um, before I was a photographer or understood that that's what I had to be, um, I was a teacher. Um, and so, um, and my father is a teacher. Um, and so it was, it, was not, it was not hard for me to imagine um, once I realized that I, I needed to be a photographer and to make pictures, it wasn't hard for me to think a little bit about being able to, or eventually wanting to teach it um, or teach people engaged with it as well. Um, and I, I mean, I got to say, I, I, uh, I think I'm, I really think I'm extremely lucky. I'm really, really, really grateful um, because for a long time I wasn't sure of, of, what I was interested in doing or, or how I might pursue, um, you know, a life. And so um, when I figured out that I was interested in making photographs and that this was something that I could do for the rest of my life and never figure it out, um, that made me very happy. And being able to also share that um, experience with other people um, 
was also really um, important, was fairly exciting. So I, again, feel really lucky to have found that pursuit. And I also feel amazingly lucky to be able to um, share those kinds of excitements and enthusiasms with um, uh, some other people that are interested. Um, I mean, that's like, um, that's really, um, I'm just, like I said, I think I feel really lucky to be able to do that. And um, to go more directly at your question, um, I, I think I learn lots and lots of things from going into um, the, the dark room or the classroom and, um, and have conversations with students about um, what they're interested in and what they're, what they're photographing. Um, there's a couple uh, quotes. One of them I like a lot, which is, um, is it uh, good artists uh, imitate and great artists steal. And so I'm stealing students' ideas all the time, right? I mean, what a great place to find, you know, interesting new ideas to sort of like run with. No, I'm just kidding. But still, um, we, we, I like to think as though it's reciprocal in the way in which, um, you know, some of the students' ideas and enthusiasms rub off on me and, and maybe vice versa. Going to your um, Williams connection, uh, we're just wondering um, if you could talk a little about, bit about your experience at Williams, like if you found your interest in photography here or um, if you're like particularly excited about having your work exhibited at WICMA um, after being here as a student, um, what your connections are. Yeah, you know, um, Erica, you mentioned, and, and also CJ, both of you guys. Are you there? You guys there? Cut out um, for a bit, but. We can hear you okay, there. Okay. So, um, CJ and, and Erica, you both mentioned that you um, that you were seniors. Does that mean you're seniors, um, rising seniors, or seniors that have graduated? We both graduated. Okay. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. um, and I graduated um, in 1985. So this was a reunion year actually for me. So I'm, I'm Mark, I think I've marked, I think that's 35 years. Um, it's been a long time um, since I've been at Williams and I haven't been back that much. And so um, I was disappointed um, when I was driving to Williams and found out um, by phone that um, I wasn't going to be able to come um, because of the coronavirus and the shutdown. And it was probably not a bad thing that they kept me away because I was about four days away from coming back from um, Europe. And so I really probably, sh I should have been quarantining at that point, right? I was coming back from France. So um, one of the things I look forward to quite a bit was to be able to go back to the campus and to be able to be part of a, a program um, at the museum. Um, and I can tell you that as, a, as an undergraduate or as someone graduating in 1985, that if you had told me that that was what was gonna happen, I would have laughed and I would have said, you are absolutely crazy because that would have been the last thing in the world that I would have ever thought would have been happening 35 years later, honestly. And so I didn't ever dream of um, making art or making photographs or whatever you want to call it um, as I left Williams. Um, I did have um, the benefit of my Williams education in, um, I think, opening up a fair amount of curiosity and curiosity within American studies for the ways in which things connect one to the other, especially when you might not expect there to be connections in the first place. And so I think that um, that um, way of um, analyzing and looking at things that seem like they don't have much to do with one another, but all of a sudden rejoicing and discovering how much they do have something to do with, with each other is a product of um, a Williams education or being at Williams, because um, I wasn't always in classes much, um, but, um, but that was also a different era, okay? Um, but the, um, the, the prospect of, of making pictures and then having them up at, uh, at the college and actually be part of the Williams College collection 
uh, the Museum of Arts collection is something that I'm extremely um, proud of and excited about. Um, and again, I think it's just one of the things about liberal arts that I think is just so wonderful is that I think it's good training for the kind of uncertainty um, that I've been talking about. And the idea that um, we can't really know what's in store for us. And that's actually, I think, an exciting prospect. Um, one of the things that I try to ask myself at, at different moments is what was going on five years ago? And could I have been, would I have been surprised by what's happening now? And, um, and, and, and one of the ways that I'm very, I, I try to keep, I try to keep, and that's been true throughout. And I, I try to keep that um, happening. It's like, well, I hope, hope, hope that five years from now, um, I will have no idea um, at this stage right now um, what that will be like. And I think that that's, that's from um, the time that I spent at Williams, um, that, sort of, uh, that sort of way of, of looking at things. And that's what enabled me to then go on and um, stumble into making photographs. I don't think I would have ever been able to realize um, the significance and the importance of making things um, unless I had had that kind of exposure and training at Williams. And then also the thing that, that helped, but it's, just, it's not connected, but I have to mention it because um, you asked. Um, there is this guy named Walker Evans. He's a photographer who um, I stumbled on a couple of years after I left Williams. Um, and he be, he, he's become someone that's really been important um, in influencing my decision to sort of go into making pictures. And it turns out that he was a student at Williams College. Um, he lasted a year, um, and, uh, and then he went on to do some amazing things. Um, so um, I think a little bit about the Williams connection there as well. And thank you for, for uh, putting this together, Nina, very much. Thank you. And thank you, guys. Those are wonderful questions. I really enjoyed it very much. And thanks for uh, listening, putting up with it.